And a very big good morning to everybody here for week four of Ask X Factor Live. Good morning, everybody. Everyone's starting to arrive. I'll just give you all a second to grab a seat. I uh, hope you've got a nice, nice coffee or a cup of tea there to settle in and, and hear all about predictive data and analytics this morning. Good morning, Robbie. Thanks for joining us. People arriving. Leanne, good morning. Peter, hi. Good morning from sunny Melbourne. I'm here in sunny Melbourne and our guest is joining us from Sydney this morning. I'll introduce you to Adam in uh, just a moment. Um, thanks everyone for, for registering for our session today. This is week four of an 18 week program that we're running. Um, today is all about solving problems um, using predictive data and analytics. So we're really excited to have Adam with us today. Welcome those who are just joining us now. Good morning, Kylie. Um, for those who haven't used Zoom webinar platform before, it's pretty simple. There's a chat box that you can click on just there. So let's give that a test now. If you all just want to type in the, in the chat box and let me know where you're joining us from today. Are you here in Victoria? Are you up north somewhere overseas on a yacht? Um, just make a little note there and uh, we can make sure that you know how to, to use that chat box. Um, so I am Julia Keedy. I am your host this morning. It's lovely to meet you all. Uh, for those who don't know me, I have spent the last 10 years in what I call the social impact sector, the social purpose sector. Um, one of the highlights of the last 10 years was being the founding CEO of the Australian Women Donors Network, after which I pretty much became an accidental consultant um, and consulting for about seven years with hundreds of different types of social change makers in business, philanthropy, CSR, um, for purpose organisations and social enterprises. I guess it was over those seven years that I could start to see a number of different ways that we could make life easier, cheaper, um, and maybe a bit more fun to be a social change maker. And in the last six months, I have kicked off the first stage of the X Factor Collective, and which is a community of really highly skilled, amazing consultants, coaches and small businesses um, who support the social impact sector. And we're looking at ways that we can work more collaborative, collaboratively together. Um, the second part of that is programs like this, that I could see time and time again that people would just have, you know, very, very simple questions that were holding them back from, from progressing their social mission in their organisation or in their family or whatever they were doing, whatever they believed in. Um, and so we thought we would pilot an 18-week program. We've got 24 of our members of the X Factor Collective um, in those 18 weeks as a pilot. So far, so good, going well. Um, today is not a webinar. Um, there is no big sell at the end. We are doing this um, at no charge every week. It's part of our social mission to, to make life easier um, and to get your questions answered. So welcome everybody. Um, just one moment there while I just fix something there. So good morning, Tanya. We've got more people joining. Good morning, John. Good morning, everybody. So I've just introduced myself. I'm Julia Keedy founder of the X Factor Collective and the host here at Ask X Factor this morning. Um, so we are here for the next 45 minutes. Uh, we already have a series of questions that we're going to answer this morning, all about predictive data and analytics. Please feel free to ask your questions today. That's what we're all about. Um, you may have your question answered in some of the content we'll go through with Adam this morning, but just pop it into the chat box there and we can, we can work through some of those questions with you today. We are recording the session and we will create little mini episodes of each of these questions and that will all be launched on our YouTube channel, The Exchange, um, next month, which we're really excited about. Um, one last little bit of housekeeping before we get started. If the link does drop out for you, wherever you are, you can dial in on the phone. Um, so here's two phone numbers um, that you can just do a screenshot of and there's the code there to enter and you can hop in on the phone. So hopefully we won't have any tech issues um, here this morning and uh, a very big welcome. So we've got Kylie joining us from Melbourne. Good morning, Kylie. Good morning, Peter from Melbourne. A fine spring morning indeed it is. Um, good morning, Robbie from Corindai and Leanne from Melbourne. Fantastic. 
Well, let's get into it. Um, I'm delighted to introduce you to Adam uh, of SEER Data and Analytics. SEER are a foundation member of the X Factor Collective and we're just so proud to have such leaders um, in the community that we're building here at X Factor um, because data, as we know, is absolutely paramount for making evidence-based decisions um, in the work that we all do. So, uh, SEER are helping organisations in the social purpose sector, um, really radically transforming our understanding and deepening our awareness of how data algorithms and analytics can help us solve the social problems that we, that we deeply care about. So, um, Adam, welcome. You're the Chief Data Scientist uh, for SEER. Uh, we're here for the next 40 minutes together to go through some incredible content. I've try and keep pace with some of this. It's not my area of expertise. Um, but I just wanted to hear from you, Adam. Tell me, how does, how does someone become a chief data scientist? What's your background? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Julia. Um, great to be here. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Um, yeah, so how, how did I become a, a, a chief data scientist or just a data scientist at all? Um, yeah, so my background was actually in engineering. I came to data science um, through a, an applied mathematics lens. I worked for six years at a, a firm of a global firm of engineers and environmental scientists and um, discovered a love of data and data analytics through that work. Um, we did some excellent work with you know, really large data sets to help form foundational elements of a variety of strategic planning pieces for utilities around Australia, which was um, terrific work. Um, yeah, and so then essentially through, um, you know, through my interest in the field, um, you know, reading a lot of, um, a lot of texts, a lot of, um, you know, papers published by people in the field, um, and then through um, a couple of courses, one through a terrific course through General Assembly here in Sydney, who I believe run uh, elsewhere as well, um, you know, picking up some more, uh, you know, formal introduction to some of the tools and techniques that you know, data scientists typically use. Um, for those who, you know, are new to the, the concept of data science, um, you know, we work with large data sets often, uh, and that's really all about, you know, using data to, uh, you know, understand how your business is operating or how, um, really understand how, uh, you know, how any process that's operating in the world, um, you know, is operating, how the various influences in, uh, influence the various outcomes that you might be wanting to look at. And, um, yeah, and so then looking at ways uh, essentially to use, um, you know, more advanced techniques like programming techniques in Python and other, you know, sort of uh, programming languages to, um, to do those analyses, um, statistical analyses and things like that. So um, then, uh, you know, we, my, myself and my co-founder, Christine Mansfield, we founded SEER um, through a shared passion for applying uh, data science and applying uh, essentially mathematical and, and, um, and technical techniques uh, to help solve social problems because we recognize that there's, um, there's a, you know, an issue in, in, in the world right now where lots of these algorithms and algor algorithmic techniques are being used in all the wrong ways, you know, to drive huge profits for organizations that aren't, you know, interested in the welfare and well-being of, of people in the community. And, um, you know, and there's, there's, a, there's a huge, there's a panoply of opportunities um, to use data analytics and predictive modeling uh, to help people. And so that's what we're really passionate about doing. And that's, that's now our focus in, with uh, data science. That's a fantastic introduction and, and so exciting for not just Australia, but I'm sure all over the world, people being able to use what you're creating, your knowledge and the platform that you're creating. So very exciting to see uh, Australian brilliance shared here locally, but also internationally. Very exciting to watch your journey, Adam, over the next couple of years as this gets more widely implemented. So um, Adam has kindly put together some great uh, slides actually for Ask X Factor this morning. Thanks, Adam. And what we're going to do is go through a range of questions now. And they're the most common questions that we're getting um, around predictive data and analytics. Um, and some of the questions that you've asked us over the last couple of weeks as well. So we might jump into some questions. Um, feel free to have a think about if there's anything 
over the next half an hour or so that you'd like clarification on. We're here to do that this morning um, with you and for you. Um, and we'll also be creating these as recordings if you missed that at the start, little mini episodes that we'll be able to share with you and you can go back to at any time and, and also share with your networks. So let's get into it, shall we? Uh, the first question, and I'm just going to call this up on the screen as well. Thanks, Adam, for preparing these. This is really great. The first question that we have here is, oh, just move on from that one. Now the first question we have is, what, what questions can I ask, Adam, to make predictions for improving service delivery, program development or fundraising? Thanks, Julia. Yeah, so um, essentially what, what, we're, what we're really driving at, um, you know, when we talk to organisations who are perhaps not quite familiar with data science and predictive modelling, um, you know, is, is really how to, how to identify the opportunities in their organization for using predictive modeling um, and really unleashing the, the, the benefit and the power of predictive modeling for those, um, for those organizations, which can be difficult, um, you know, when, you're exper when your experience and exposure to analytics has really been, you know, you might have seen some statistics cited, you know, through reports, or you might have seen dashboards that are produced you know, in business intelligence uh, platforms to let you know, you know, like how your, how your sales and marketing are tracking, how your customer engagement is tracking, um, you know, what your service delivery operations and performance metrics look like. Um, and we, we have a paradigm um, for, for data and data maturity, essentially, which um, expresses a transition from uh, that retrospective uh, approach and thinking to a more uh, future focused and foresight oriented um, approach. And that's really where the predictive element of um, predictive model comes in. So um, the key question really to ask if you can boil it down to one is just, you know, what are the things that are occurring um, in your organization that, you know, are mysterious to you in some way, you know, um, mm -hmm. what are the things that occur that if you could have known ahead of time, you know, that this was going to occur, that that particular event was going to occur, uh, perhaps you could have put in place, you know, some kind of intervention or you could have done something differently that would have better positioned you to, um, to adapt to that circumstance or to react to that circumstance. So it's, um, it's yeah, really about, um, you know, what are those mysterious elements? Where could we, um, you know, where could we have done things better had we known that that was going to happen? Um, so we've got just a couple of examples that, you know, to bring that to life a little bit for people uh, that we'd love to share if, if that's possible. So... The first one that you can see uh, we're talking a little bit about there is um, some work that we're doing with one of our clients in uh, regional Victoria in Shepparton, Primary Care Connect, um, fantastic organisation. Um, their, their focus is helping people in the community, um, you know, who might be in need of support, uh, you know, for a variety of, um, of social issues or, or problems that they might be having. Typically, they'll be... Um, they'll be receiving people to, to engage with them through counseling services, coaching services, things of that, of that nature, where there's a conversational element taking place and over a period of time, somebody will get help. Uh, but essentially what we found was that, uh, you know, when we, when we began to engage with PCC and, and opened up their data and showed them how their, how their business was operating. Um, one of the, one of the key, um, you know, mysterious elements of their operations was, for them that uh, they had a, a very high rate of people who would, um, who would approach PCC, Primary Care Connect, would approach PCC and say, you know, I really need help with a problem that I'm having, you know, in my life. Um, you know, I've, perhaps I've been referred to PCC through one channel or another. Um, you know, can you help me? And PCC will have that conversation with that person and say, yes, we've got a program that's really going to help you. In um, you know, let's sign you up to that program and get you back in to start having those, those um, therapeutic consultations. That program will be signed up, that person will leave, and then they'll never be seen again. And, um, and that would typically, as you'd imagine, happen for a variety of reasons. Perhaps, you know, they're having difficulty attending because of scheduling, or perhaps they've got, you know, other conflicting elements in their, in their circumstance that's making it challenging for them. But essentially, um, what we identified was an opportunity there to, uh, to make a prediction at that moment, at that first conversation, make a prediction about whether or not that individual was at a high likelihood or a low likelihood to return for, that, for those follow-up uh, conversations and, and consultations. 
And so um, through predictive modeling, we were able to develop uh, essentially the, a little piece of software that is actually in development right now, um, which contains a little mathematical model. And that mathematical model will take all the information that that, that clinician is, um, is able to gather about that person in that first conversation, put it through that model, and that model makes a prediction about whether or not they're going to attend. And that prediction can um, you know, be visible to that clinician and can really just provide them with a little bit of insight and intelligence in the moment. Um, about, you know, something that they would otherwise not have been able to foresee necessarily. And that's going to be, that's going to be able to prompt that clinician to be able to have a conversation in a very specific and targeted way with that individual, um, perhaps offer them some supports or services, have a conversation with them about attendance and what might be barriers for them uh, to attending that service and how PCT can support them to attend. Um, so that's, that's kind of, you know, one really sort of simple example where something's happening. We can't necessarily see ahead of time with confidence that it's, you know, what the outcome's likely to be. Um, and this is a way of using predictive modeling to really uh, shine some light on that circumstance and help uh, improve the likelihood uh, of that outcome being a positive one for PCC and for that, and for that client. So you've got some more examples there as well, Adam. Um, this one is in, in fundraising. Can you explain this to us? Yeah, so this is another really um, a classic example, uh, particularly for the not-for-profit sector, um, of where predictive modeling can add great value. Um, so there are a number, of, there are a variety of heuristic models for identifying high-value uh, donors. I'll just introduce a little, a little bit um, quickly before. And so, you know, in the not-for-profit sector, as, of, as lots of people will already be aware, um, fundraising is a key element to their to their operations. So, in order to continue to provide the value and achieve the mission of that organization, they need to have a strong funding stream and um, then they'll often engage in direct marketing or direct appeals um, or a variety of other types of appeals and campaigns to their database of supporters, you know, and identifying who's likely to, re to respond the right way to the right campaign is a really important thing for them to be able to do so that they can really maximize their return on investment on those um, fundraising services. So, and as I began to say, there are a variety of heuristic uh, models that you know are sort of in place that some organisations use currently to, um, to 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 do that high value donor pr uh, behavioural prediction, um, frequency, recency, and value models would be a typical one. I won't go into the details, um, but you know some people might be familiar with those concepts. Uh, using predictive modelling essentially would be uh, you know the next the next step in that evolution towards uh, towards predicting the behavior of, of um, specific individuals. So using what we know about that individual in terms of, you know, personal details perhaps, or details about, you know, um, their behavioral history with that organization, how many uh, appeals they've received in recent history, what their donation history looks like, um, you know, how they're responding to various campaigns. We can take that information and we can generate, we can train a model, train a predictive uh, machine learning model that will make a prediction about whether or not somebody is likely to respond in the right way or in the way that we'd like to a particular campaign, um, whether over a period of time they're likely to be amongst a, a cohort of high value donors that might be the focus for a sustained campaign over a period of time. Um, you know, insights like that would be, you know, the kind of wow. really lend themselves well to, uh, to the not-for-profit sector with the fundraising can certainly see that being um, incredibly valuable um, here and all around the world. I can see that that'll be quite a popular, popular implementation, that one, Adam. And you've got one more um, example here as well that we might move on to. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is really, um, this is really an attraction opportunity for us to introduce um, a, a, an initiative, um, an innovation that we're developing here at SEER, which uh, is a data platform. Um, and this is essentially what this is, is a piece of infrastructure for the community, uh, for the community sector. So be that the not-for-profit sector, collective impact groups, um, charities, um, you know, organizations of that kind um, who, might have, um, who might rely on data for a variety of their service planning, strategic planning, um, you know, service improvement or, or um, you know, activities of that kind where they'd be relying on uh, publicly available data or open data sets, they might have a need to, um, you know, compare their service, uh, their service map with the map of, you know, potential recipients of that service. Uh, so they rely on a lot of these um, data sets, but finding those data sets in the 
first place, making sure that they're the right ones, um, migrating those data sets into an environment where they can work with them, and then having um, you know, the, the, the familiarity with data, a comfort, a comfort and a conversance with data to be able to work with it in those environments can be really challenging, and particularly in a sector that um, you know, isn't, isn't uh, traditionally or, or um, you know, particularly data-oriented and, and mathematically um, you know, oriented. It can be very challenging and daunting. So this platform uh, in its first iteration is really about making a library of, of data available to the community and not-for-profit sector. Um, core data sets of, you know, that are publicly available as the first pass um, you know, that they can use, they can find, they can work with it inside the platform um, in a way that's very um, framework agnostic, we say. So where a lot of other platforms might be providing specific kinds of answers to questions that they want to give you the answers to. Um, our platform is really about providing a very general set of tools and techniques to find, blend, analyze data. And, and, uh, and the other core element to that platform is that it's a, it's a collaborative environment. So where you have um, a piece of work that you're doing with a piece of data, you might be able to connect another user um, to that piece of work and collaborate with them to find the right data, um, provide um, you know, some, some feedback um, you know, in the form of conversations and comments and, and, and layering uh, that analysis with local intelligence. Um, you know, perhaps we, we really, um, we're not sure about the validity or, or how uh, reliable that particular data set is in that particular year because we know, for example, that um, you know, the, the children in our community were sent home early on the day that they were supposed to be taking the NAPLAN test or um, whatever that other circumstance that might have intervened might be. But on this particular other year, you know, that's a really rock solid um, year that we can really hang our hat on and, and rely on for, um, you know, for planning our services and just providing an environment where those kinds of conversations can take place. Um, is the sure. other um, and in the future, um, the platform yeah. looks fantastic. The platform looks fantastic, Adam. Um, is it is it currently available, or is it rolling out? Uh, when is it rolling out? It's rolling out very soon. So we're going to be going into what we're calling a closed beta testing phase in um, late in uh, this month, and then as of um, as of the new year, uh, we'll be launching live. For, uh, for anybody to sign up to be able Fantastic. to uh, um, and begin to work with it. So. Oh, congratulations. It's a, it's a huge development and, a, and a, a real win for the sector to have something like this. Let's, let's move on to the next question, um, Adam, um, that, that, we, that, we, uh, that you often get and that we often hear, and, and that is what, what data sources do we need? How would you answer that? This is a really, this is a really important question, and and again, one that a lot of people in um, you know the not-for-profit sector in particular struggle with. Um, being a data, uh, not necessarily in possession of a lot of data that they can um, that they can use. Um, essentially, what, what we would say is that uh, as a as a first step, you know what what we're really relying on uh, when we're doing data an analytics and predictive modeling. Um, is domain knowledge. So it's really important. The first thing that we do when we engage with an organization um, to understand their circumstance and how we can apply our tools and techniques in their environment is, um, you know, what is it that they're really trying to achieve, you know? So um, if that's a collective impact group, um, as, such as the Lighthouse, you can see an example of a couple of reports there. Um, you know, what are, what are the core cohorts that they're attempting to, uh, to help or provide services for? And what are the core outcomes that they're really interested in, um, you know, as ways of benchmarking the performance, how, how much impact they're having? Um, and then what's the theory of change? So we build, um, you know, we build a, a conceptual understanding of, you know, what the, uh, what, the, what the theory is behind the activities that they're doing and what they're really trying to achieve. And the next step would be asking questions of the kind that we mentioned earlier. So we were saying, you know, what are the mysterious elements of the process that we're, that we're observing here uh, that we can use predictive modeling to unpack and provide a lens onto? So, um, you know, if that's, uh, if that's an outcome on a particular educational metric, um, you know, what are the predictive factors that, um, you know, we might be able to look at that's going to shine a light on that? Um, so if that's, 
uh, you know, for example, kindergarten attendance or um, the rates of children who are, uh, you know, attending maternal health checks um, or, you know, um, other, a variety of other health related factors that might impact uh, a readiness for school. You know, those are things that we can unpack um, and start to look at. So a lot of those things are going to be, um, you know, going to be available through publicly available data sets. Um, that we can, through the platform that we looked at a moment ago, introduce to those organizations as a way of, of um, setting a, a foundation for that work. Um, then in the, into, into the future, what, um, what those organizations might start to look at is collecting data um, from their organization, from their community, I should say, about those predictive elements to get uh, real time um, you know, intelligence about what's going on. Um, yeah, so, you know, in general, when we build a predictive model, um, the other thing, you know, to, the concept that I'd like to introduce is, um, is what we're doing is we're, we're providing um, a, a long, long, long list of observations of outcomes that have occurred in the past. So we're trying to train a machine on the basis of example observations. So here's a variety. In this particular example, here's a variety of contextual measurements that we took, and here's the outcome that we observed. You know, and then in the next example, here's the context, and here's the outcome. We build up a, a rather a large data set um, in that way, and that's essentially what we provide to our algorithm to learn from. And those are the kinds of um, data sources that we'd be looking to leverage um, yeah, when we build a predictive model. Great. Yeah, absolutely. That's really handy. And I think the list there as well in terms of the data sources that you do actually use there, the government data sets, you know, partner organisation data files and, and complaints. And it just, it's quite extensive, obviously, the, the different sources that you can bring into the picture and blend um, to, to help help tell these stories and, and, and look at the mysteries, as you say, and that's a great way. Um, I love that mysterious aspect. I'm going to take that forward in terms of how I explain this further. So, no, that's, that's really great, Adam. Um, if you've just only joined us in the last few minutes, a uh, very big welcome to Ask X Factor session. This is week four of, of 18 weeks. And we're, we're here today with Adam Peaston of SEER Data and Analytics, who are foundation members of the X Factor Collective. Um, we are recording the session and cutting up these questions into little mini episodes. So if you need to dash off in the next 15 minutes or so, feel free. Um, but if you've got any specific questions here today for Adam as well, please feel free to drop them in the chat box there and we can jump onto them um, for you. We've actually got a set of um, fantastic uh, content here that Adam has prepared for us. Um, looking at a range of different questions. So let's jump into the next one, Adam. Um, what are some of the benefits of using data and analytics? Yeah, so, I mean, as we were saying, uh, as I was saying before, those who weren't quite, um, who, haven't, who haven't joined yet, um, our, our theory of, of, um, of organisations who, who might be in a state of, um, of uh, data literacy or, or interested in improving their data literacy we articulate this, um, this transitionary framework from a, um, a retrospective perspective where uh, really what that is about is, is pulling together data to just understand, and make sure that we have a, a, a good picture of what happened in the past. Um, so that might be, you know, where you're looking at a particular uh, data stream. Uh, you know, if you're looking at a CRM or some other kind of administrative um, data capture and data storage facility, uh, making sure that you've got those data sources coming in so that you can paint that really rich picture about, um, you know, events as they're occurring in the past. Uh, you know, on the basis of that data, then we might build uh, dashboards and things that will articulate for businesses and organizations, you know, how these various data streams um, evolve over time together. Um, as we bring these data sources together, we say, we start to be able to draw inferences and look at trends. So, you know, this indicator is moving up, this indicator is moving down, and typically perhaps these two indicators um, co-occur or move up together and move down together. And where you can start to see patterns like that evolving, it naturally suggests uh, perhaps some kind of a causation or perhaps something else that's causing both of those things to occur. You know, it's a clue essentially to the underlying mechanism that you can really use um, to start to understand what's likely to happen into the future. And that's where we move into predictive 
uh, analytics phase where you start to say, on the basis of what we understand about the way uh, you, that process is occurring in the world, um, we can conceptualize a model. We can imagine that these factors together are contributing in some way to the outcome that we're really interested in predicting um, that mysterious element that we mentioned earlier, um, that we might be otherwise in a, in a state of difficulty to sort of anticipate that it's going to happen. So then putting together a model that's a predictive model that's going to let us see into the future what's likely to happen. And then finally, uh, the, the, the holy grail of predictive analytics um, is to move then into a prescriptive phase. So once um, once an organization has their data in the data house in order with the what happened, the retrospective, they're starting to get a picture of how these data sets um, relate to one another and the relationships that are in there. They can understand what's likely to happen and what their model is able to give them predictions that they can, they can take action on the basis of, right? So, you know, where that might have been previously, we mentioned the attendance um, app that was going to help primary care connect, know when someone's not likely to attend. The next thing for them to be able to do is to capture what they did as a result of that circumstance. So, um, you know, that this particular person was unlikely to attend, you know, of our menu of, of, uh, of supports that we could offer them. This was one that they took up. What was the outcome? And then on the basis of that even richer data set, then we can say not just what's likely to happen, but given that circumstance and what we can see happening, what should be done, what should you do in order to get the best possible outcome for that person or the desired outcome for that person. And so that's really kind of the benefit in terms of the whole um, trajectory from, from retrospective to uh, predictive and then prescriptive. And there's a there's really kind of the, the benefit that an organization can start to leverage the more, um, the more familiar and, and capable they become with data. Yeah, fantastic, Adam. That's great. And you've got just here um, on, on the next screen, which actually shows, you know, just outlines um, a couple of those core areas on, on efficiencies and benefits. And no doubt this is a great, a great slide and a great tool for people that are, um, you know, trying to build buy-in in their organisation to have this type of conversation at a strategic and an executive level. So being able to just sort of demonstrate these very clear benefits, I'm sure, is um, really helping, helping people, you know, deepen their awareness of, of the opportunity um, here with data and analytics. Yeah, absolutely. That's great. Fantastic. Um, so we'll move on to um, the next question. And that is, what, what skill sets do I need as an organisation, as a leader in the space? What skill sets would I need to get started in this area? Um, so, yeah, the, and this is a really great question. One of, what, one of our kind of core ambitions as an organisation is to build capacity in the sector, not just, you know, do the analytics um, and and create models and hand them off. But, um, you know, embed within these organizations the ability to think deeply about their data sources, um, you know, what intelligence they want to gather about their operations and their services, and, you know, what the opportunities are for applying data and analytics and predictive modeling. Um, so in terms of skill sets that people um, really need, again, you know, what we, what we would say is firstly, um, you really need to have a deep knowledge of the entirety of the organization that, or the entirety of the part of the organization that you're trying to, um, you're trying to help. Um, where we sort of, where, we're, where I was articulating a, um, a conceptual framework for the process that's underway um, in that business, then, you know, that would be the first step is really understand the mechanism that's at play. Uh, and that's, that's and, you know, with regard to that first point on the slide here is understanding the question. So, um, you know, what's the, process that's play. what are we trying to address what are our core um what are our core metrics that we're using to understand whether or not we're achieving our mission um the next then and really you know what we would then say is once you understand the question we can then help to develop um those analytics on the basis of those questions so once a question is well formed um somebody with uh you know with mathematical skills with um with uh, dashboard building skills and modeling skills um, you know, that kind of a person with those kind of skills can take those well-formed questions and produce the kinds of intelligence and the kinds of results that an organization is really um, really looking for um, so if an organization you know is of a, is of a sufficient size um, you know the, the next step for them might be to start talking to um, perhaps an analytics 
companies such as ours, or perhaps start talking to individuals that they might um, that they might be able to uh, get to help them with those um, with those technical aspects. So, what might a dashboard look like that shows us, you know, how this process is operating and how that process is operating? Um, you know, what what might a modeling um, you know tool look like that helps us? understand you know when this is likely to happen and when that's likely to happen how would we deploy those um you know in our organization the kinds of skills really um you know understanding the the, the framework and the essence of the problem that you're, you're trying to solve um you know and then understanding the mapping between the predictive modeling uh and that so the solution and that problem um to, to understand the kind of answer that a predictive model is going to provide that's uh, great that's really useful, Adam. I hope that that question, that answer has helped everybody in terms of what skills you might need in-house. And just looking across in the chat box while, while you've been talking about skills and also the benefits, um, Peter has actually um, asked a question uh, which has been answered by your co-founder, actually, which is very clever. I love this. Um, Peter has said that the challenge in his organisation is actually selling the value of data in the first instance. Um, yeah. yeah, Christy has provided a fantastic response here um, saying that stories of how others are using data to generate insights for improved decision making is, is really what's helping most people, um, you know, I guess sell it, sell it up, get the buy in at an organisation level to actually begin in this area. Is that, is that your experience, Adam? Yeah, it, it absolutely is. Um, you know, Christy there is pointing out, you know, stories are an excellent way of, of um, of conveying the value from a human perspective, you know, in a, in a particular circumstances and particularly in circumstances where the value proposition is inherently humanistic. So where we're talking about improving the outcomes for individuals in the community, telling a story about how a predictive model was able to intervene at the right time and change the trajectory for somebody in their life. Um, excellent way of selling the value of that data project. Um, it might not always be necessarily about, um, but, but not-for-profits do a variety of different things. So in the example that we saw earlier, which was all about fundraising, for example, uh, then selling the value of a predictive model uh, or, or a data project of that kind, um, take more of a business case, you know, the brass tax type value proposition. So, you know, if we're able to identify, if we're able to shift, for example, our, uh, our engagement rates on a particular type of campaign from, you know, 5% to maybe 15 or 20%, uh, you know, what's that like to look like in terms of return on that investment? Um, and what's the improvement in our overall fundraising situation that could look like as a result? So some relatively simple back of the envelope type calculations can give you an idea of what kind of benefit you'd see you know, on the fundraising side. Um, and that'll give you an idea as well for, you know, how much budget a project like that ought to receive, um, you know, its first iteration. What's the value we can derive from that project as a first pass? Then we can have a conversation with providers about, you know, how much a project like that might cost and what might be involved. And we can talk about that, um, you know, as well, if, if that might be helpful, perhaps um, in a slide or two. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and also, I guess, being able to, Peter, find, find the places that um, Sear and Adam and Christy are going to be speaking in the public domain and, and get key influencers um, in the room to hear from them, whether it's a forum like this or, or something else. I think Christy's just saying here there's a data innovation lab in Melbourne coming soon. Fantastic for people to ideate around how data can help solve social problems. Chris is saying everyone's welcome. So we'll send that link out in, in our follow-up email to everyone as well. So we'll make sure, make sure that you have that information, those key dates um, to, to come and meet Adam and Christy um, and also the clients who are, who are benefiting uh, from this and get those stories. So that's, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, you can jump onto our website as well and find out a bit more about... Uh, Adam and, and Christy and what Sierra up to. Here's just a little snapshot. Uh, all of our members have their own profile page, which just gives you a quick snapshot of, of who they are, um, clients that they work with. As well, you can see there's some testimonials, which might also be helpful, uh, Peter, in terms of selling that up the line. You might be able to share some of those testimonials from other people who are having success in this area. So feel free to jump onto the website 
uh, we can connect you straight up with, um, with Adam and, and go from there. We are going to answer a couple more questions. Uh, before we do, um, just go to a quick ad break. Um, <laughs> Not really an ad break, um, but just to let you know, we are week four of an 18-week program, a pilot ourselves, a big learning journey to see how we can make life easier for social change makers doing programs such as this. Uh, we're here every Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock with a different subject matter expert from our, from our amazing X Factor community. Um, over the next couple of weeks, we've got a, a very diverse range of topics coming up there that you can see. So um, feel free to jump onto the website, have a look. We are running through till Christmas. Uh, we've got John Bishop next week um, and John's just absolutely fantastic. He's the co-founder of Pet Rescue, uh, which is one of the most trafficked charity websites in Australia from a tech and IT point of view. John is really great at helping small organisations and small businesses, um, you know, use, get really friendly with technology. And John's always said to me, Julia, just let technology be your answer. Um, and so I, I, I say, thanks, John. Um, now what do I do with it? <laughs> so John's great. Um, we're going to have a conversation next week about everything to do with tech and IT. Uh, followed there by uh, Deb Milligan, who's been a part of the arts and creative sector for many, many decades, um, with a lot of experience to share, a lot of uh, projects she's been involved with to really help give tangible examples and ideas around how people can harness arts um, in the social sector as well. Uh, followed by Ruth Jones, who's just returned last year from many years of running International Social Venture Partners International, a key leader in the philanthropic sector, who's also a foundation member of the X Factor Collective. Great people, um, you know, great um, smart people, heart smart people, I call them, and you're going to love having um, time with them here every Wednesday. So that's my ad break, um, just to let you know who's coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, let's move back on to a couple more questions. Adam, we've only got about five minutes to go, so we might go through these ones a little bit quicker, but I'm sure you probably have more questions and, you know, do go and see um, Adam and Christy at the Data Innovation Lab coming up in Melbourne. Do connect in and um, do ask more questions. So moving on to the next question here, Adam, is... Um, I might move across from how organisations are using data and predictive analytics because we've sort of covered that. And if it's okay, could we talk about what are some of the risks in this area? Um, what about privacy? What, I'm sure some of these questions come up in your conversations all the time. Can you explain to us a little bit about risks and privacy? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, data, many people will be very familiar with a lot of the risks that are involved in using data. It's obviously very topical right now. You know, we've had recent headlines and everybody will be aware of you know, the, the scandals in the US about hacking and personal information being used to, um, you know, influence political outcomes and um, a lot of different risks uh, and outcomes like that. So it's, it's a very important thing for, for our organization to be able to talk as well about uh, risks and privacy. Um, we, you know, when we're talking with organizations about projects that we undertake with them, um, our first step essentially before, before we start working with their data, before we start suggesting that we start looking at their data is to undertake a risk assessment. Um, that risk assessment is, is really about trying to understand, you know, we understand the data that you're, that you're holding. Perhaps we've had a conversation and we, we know that we're going to be, there'll be personal details in that data set and um, you know, and, and it's really about us going, which elements do we really need and which can we perhaps leave behind, um, you know, when we take possession of the elements that we're going to use to create the outcomes and, and the insights that that, that organisation really needs. Um, so that risk assessment is, is intended to document that, that process and really make sure that, you know, everybody who's involved is, is, um, is really confident that the right processes and, and barriers have been put in place to protect privacy um, and keep that data in a secure way. Um, so, you know, other than saying it's, it's really, really important to do, there are a variety of legislative frameworks that are in place that, you know, we're aware of and that we work to to make sure that, you know, those organisations are protected and, and compliant. Um, the Australian Privacy Act and the privacy principles that are in place um, are something that we help organisations to work through. 
um, where we've done uh, work with organizations around uh, generating data governance frameworks, um, which essentially, you know, take a snapshot of the regulatory environment and that organization's operations, where the cross-pollination occurs, what are the key elements of those um, regulatory frameworks that they need to be aware of. Um, there have been recent changes to that environment. So in 2017, we saw the introduction of the data breaches, notifiable data breaches scheme in Australia. A lot of organizations have been doing a lot of work to understand um, you know, what they really need to put in place to make sure they're ready to adapt to you know, the unfortunate circumstance in which perhaps their data has been hacked um, you know, from within their own organization or perhaps um, leaked by one of their, one of their employees. Um, the general data privacy regulation um, out of the European Union has also come into play as of May of this year, um, you know, which again mirrors a lot of the elements that you know, Australian organisations were already uh, required to be compliant with, but you know, with a little bit more focus on consent um, and a little bit more focus on the right of the individual, especially when it comes to things like being forgotten and having their data deleted. Um, so privacy, risk and security are, are core elements to our work in terms of you know, how we help organisations to make sure that they are uh, keeping on top of, of their obligations in that environment. Um, and we help them work through a variety of different um, you know, processes that we can put in place when we work with their data and when they work with their data um, to keep that secure. So as I said before, um, you know, there's a risk assessment. And what falls out of that risk assessment might be a series of um, you know, barriers that we can put in place, we can help them put in place um, you know, around keeping that data secure. So one might be um, you know, governance, as we mentioned previously. So what are the permissioning rights and access protocols for getting at that data? A second barrier might be technology. So if we're taking possession of sensitive data, um, we can put in place technology barriers like encrypted devices, air gaps between storage devices and the internet, for example, um, you know, and, techno and uh, lots of other esoteric types of technology. Yeah, sure. Yeah, great. And, uh, and finally, um, modifications. So, you know, what elements of the data can we obscure or leave behind um, you know, to minimise the risk or minimise the likelihood of that data ever getting into an environment we want it to be in. Um, Fantastic. And Christy's just sort of made a note here in the chat box as well about responsible data being a real key consideration with a link there that people might want to um, just screenshot that for themselves as well, the responsible data governance and a great resource that Christy has been able to share there. We, we are at time. We do run to 10.45. I am, however, aware that one of the burning questions is, you know, what does this cost to get started? Um, so maybe we could actually just address that question. If anyone needs to leave, completely understand. Thank you so much for being here today. But if you do want to stay just for a couple of more moments, we are just going to have a look at what are some of the costs? How are some organisations, what are the tools that they're using? Um, and what are some of the costs involved? So I'll say farewell to anyone that needs to dash off. Um, but now over to you, Adam, to perhaps answer this question for us. Yeah, sure. Um, so what does it cost? Um, I, I heard a moment, or I heard part of that question is to do with, um, you know, what, what are the tools that people are using? Uh, you know, and that, that's a very difficult question to answer in terms of there's just so many different tools out there that are available for people to use. And really, you know, they'll interface with what kind of um, you know, level of maturity that organization is already at in terms of their data um, and what kinds of data they're needing to capture. So, you know, anything from a lot of, a lot of organizations just straight away, um, you know, we'll be working in Excel spreadsheets. Um, you know, they'll be capturing things perhaps in access databases and other kinds of, you know, local or, or small scale databases. Uh, and then there are a variety of business intelligence tools, um, you know, Microsoft BI, Oracle um, type uh, intelligence tools. Um, people might be familiar with Tableau, um, you know, and other desktop uh, data analytics tool sets like that. Um, you know, and, and they, they, you know, I, I won't comment too much on how much each of those costs and whether or not they're appropriate because it's a very, very in-depth conversation. But um, in terms of uh, our side where we're talking about how much it might cost to, um, you know, to implement a data project, uh, you know, our services essentially would, um, you know, we talk to organizations about projects that range anywhere from, you know, something like $15,000 to do a really short, sharp, um, you know, uh, quick output type of type project where they might want to develop a dashboard or they might want to 
you know, quickly iterate towards a model and see what kind of predictions the model might give them in a particular circumstance, um, right through to, you know, perhaps a $50,000 project, which might be all about, you know, let's do a whole you know, end to end data analytics um, workup. So liberate your data from, you know, whatever storage facility it might currently be languishing in, uh, throw that together into some visualizations and help you to use those to break down your business processes and see how everything's operating. Um, and then iterate through a couple of different model types and a couple of different model deployments. So where can we, you know, we add the most value with our predictive modeling and that's, you know, a really sort of involved and, and an engaging process um, for us and our clients, uh, you know, who might need, you know, more, or might be interested in a more sort of thorough um, uh, end to end kind of engagement. Sure. Um, some of the tools on the slide there, um, you know, the tools that we're developing as, as our product output. So the, the data platform that we introduced earlier, um, you know, that we're looking at a $50 per user per month subscription. And that essentially will be access to uh, publicly available data sets that will be the ability, pardon me, to connect with other users and collaborate on data projects. And ultimately that will be, um, you know, and on top of that, the ability to create visualizations and, and um, more advanced uh, analysis and analyses outputs. And in the future, uh, uploading your own data sets uh, starting to generate data sets through uh, survey and, and mobile, app, uh, mobile application tools. And again, blending those data sets with publicly available data and with other data sets and, and generating uh, analyses and models. Um, so yeah, as we said, $50 per user per month is what we're looking at as, um, as, a, as a cost to access that tool. Uh, and then the predictive tools, those might be um, specific deployments of a particular type of model in a particular environment where uh, creating, um, you know, the, the packaged uh, predictive model that, you know, a user or a client of ours might be able to access to deliver that specific insight at that specific moment. Um, you know, that tool might be uh, something in the order of um, $10,000 to, to train that model and to create that tool. And then a subscription of something like $500 per organization per month, um, you know, to have that live and, um, and providing those insights. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, that's very useful, that information there, and no doubt will help people as they're having conversations internally to, you know, to be the champions of change in their organisations. So that's, that's great. Listen, we are um, over time. Um, that is the show uh, for this Wednesday for Ask X Factor. Um, a very big thank you to you, Adam, for all of the preparation work you've done over the last week for today's session and for sharing all of your knowledge great examples um, and really practical ways that people can start using data to solve the problems in their organisation. I love that line, liberate data. I'm also going to borrow that if that's okay. Um, so thank you everybody for tuning in today. Uh, please help us spread the word. Um, we have uh, on our website a full program that shows you exactly who in our community is coming up between now and Christmas. So there's a downloadable PDF there if you know people um, all over Australia who might not get access to this type of Q&A format, please do share it with them, spread the word. Um, we appreciate your time here today and have an absolutely beautiful day and we'll be in touch soon. All the best, everybody. Bye.